Hello, it's Dr Joan Aiden back again. Um, we're going to talk about beginnings this week, brilliant beginnings, and what makes a brilliant beginning. Whatever I write, and I do write a lot, as you probably know, from picture books up to adult, they all have something in common. They all need a cracking opening, one that will hook my readers and get them desperate to turn the page to find out what happens. So today I want to look a little bit at what works and why and give you a chance to have a go at doing it yourself. But let's start at the very, very beginning with first lines at the magical once upon a time moment. We all have our favourites. I asked around my writer friends for theirs. This one is my favourite. I found him in the garage on a Sunday afternoon. The rhythm of that is lovely. Now, if you want, you can pause the video and see if you can guess what it is and then come back and I will give you the answer. That was David Ammon's Skellig. Um, I love that. I found him in the garage on a Sunday afternoon. Who did he find in the garage and why was he there? We know it's the point of the story, so I want to know immediately. This is another one that came up several times. The monster showed up just after midnight, as they do. Again, pause the video if you want to play along. If you're not pausing or if you've just come back, that was A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness, um, whose opening and themes, I think, owe a debt to Skellig. Here's another one cited by many children's authors. Where's Papa going with that axe? That is Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. Some of you will definitely know that one. Here's another one. This one is mm, kind of, it's an adult novel, but it, it, people do cite it as YA. I don't believe it is, but that's another argument for another day. I write this sitting in the kitchen sink. That is Dodie Smith's I Capture the Castle. We know it's a domestic but topsy-turvy world that we're getting into. And that voice, I know I want to spend time with this fascinating, obviously flawed character. And we'll come back to that idea in a little bit. Here's another one. Whether I shall turn out to be the hero of my own life, or whether that station will be held by anybody else, these pages must show. That's Charles Dickens' David Copperfield. Um, the play on which, well, it was a, an adaptation, I guess. Um, the recent one um, with Dev Patel, I really recommend as, as a, a great reworking of a, of a novel. Um, this is a play on that now. If you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me and all that David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it if you want to know the truth. That, of course, is The Catcher in the Rye, J.D. Salinger. I love that it plays on its literary inheritance like that. And this is another one that takes that literary inheritance even further, acknowledging its debt twofold. It's hard to know where to start with this. I suppose I could tell you all about where I was born, what it was like when mum was still around, what happened when I was a little kid, all that kind of stuff, but it's not really relevant. That's the YA novel Martin Pig by Kevin Brooks. Um, bowing to what is considered one of the first ever YAs as well in Capture in the Rye. Again, it isn't, and I could argue at length as to why it isn't, but again, discussion for another day. Here is another one. This one is for younger readers this time. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. That is C.S. Lewis, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Don't you want to know about this boy? Poor Eustace Clarence Scrub, I do. Here is another one. Lyra and her demon moved through the darkening hall, taking care to keep to one side, out of sight of the kitchen. Of course, that is Northern Lights, Philip Pullman, one of my favourites. It sets up a fantasy world in just four words, because this is a world in which demons exist. Here is one that I think you will all know. I hope you all know. Um, Mr and Mrs Dursley of number four Privet Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. Of 
course, that is Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone by J.K. Rowling. Unusual here, we kick off with adults. Harry's not mentioned yet, but there is a reason, and I will explain that in a little bit. Now, I could do this first lines game for hours, but I won't. Um, I'd like to get you to do this. So we're going to have a go right now at conjuring some first lines. I'm going to read you some blurb from the back of a book, and I want you to write a first line. This book is Where Do You Go, Birdie Jones? This is a cheat. I am using one of my books. One, because I can. Two, because I'm pretty sure you won't actually know the real opening line. Um, it's written for nine to 12 year olds. That's something you need to think about. Okay, I'm gonna read the back for you. Dad's new family means there's no room left for Birdie. The only place that feels like home is grandpa's pigeon loft, amongst the warmth of the birds she loves to race. It's also where she meets Dogger, her only real friend. When Birdie uncovers a message from the past, she thinks it explains why she doesn't fit with her family. But the closer she gets to the truth, the further apart she becomes from Dogger. Why is he drifting away when she needs him the most? Sometimes it's those we know best who may be hiding the biggest secrets. Okay, it's your turn. What's the first line of that book? I'm, you, your aim here is not to get it right. Your aim is just to come up with a first line, basically. So you pause the video and see what you come up with. Obviously, you can rewind if you need to hear that blurb again. Okay, I'm assuming you're all coming back, having done that exercise. I'm going to read you the actual real first line of the book. Birdie don't rightly know who he is or where he come from. That's it. That's the first line of the book. Um, as I said, the point is for you not to, you, you don't need to have come up with the right line. There's no way on earth you'd be able to come up with the same line as that one. Um, the point is to see there are different ways into a story. Let me do another one with you. And uh, again, another one of mine, Joel alone. Again, I'm cheating because uh, I, because I can. Okay. Dreaming of escape from the bullies at school. Joe thinks a holiday abroad sounds perfect. So it's a shock when his mum announces she's flying to Spain with her boyfriend Dean, but no Joe. He's being left behind in their peck and flat for a week, with strict orders to stay out of trouble and out of sight. Joe makes the most of it, eating pizza for breakfast, having Xbox marathons and forming a friendship with Asha, a fellow fugitive hiding out at her grandpa's flat next door but time and money are running out. Can their friendship survive the threats that are closing in? Can Joe survive at all? So pause the video again and see what you come up with for an opening line for that. Again, that is a middle grade novel. Joe is 13, so it's actually upper end middle grade, but see what you can come up with. Okay, again, I'm assuming you're all coming back now, having written your amazing first lines. This is a slightly longer first line than the birdie one. I should know something's up right from the off, because when I get in, Dean isn't on the sofa playing Xbox. There's just that big dip there instead, and a stain from where he spilt Cherry 2020 that time. The point of this, as I said, is not to find the right line, but to realise there are hundreds of ways to start a story. But some work better than others. And in fact, actually rereading the birdie one, I am I think I might change that now if I went back and had the chance. So I want to look now at why that is, why some openings work better than others. The lines that we heard earlier, all those amazing first lines to um, novels, they work because writers know that opening pages have a purpose to them. They carry an incredible weight. They set the tone and imply the content for the rest of the novel. They need to have action and information in the right balance. They need to bring your cast on stage and they need to build that stage actually as well. I'm not talking about just the first line here obviously, but the, the opening page or so perhaps. So there's a series of specific tasks for you when you're writing an opening that will help the reader understand what they're getting into and why they need to read on. The beginning shapes a reader's expectations as well as hooking them in. So number one, a good beginning will make it clear when and where the novel is set and establish that normal world for your character. You need to set up that everyday world they will abandon before they head off in pursuit of their want. More of that 
discussion later. Number two, it will make it clear what kind of book this is. Is it a crime novel, a fantasy, a horror? Is it going to be funny? Is the language different or difficult? Readers like surprise, but it has to fit within their expectations. Number three, a great beginning will introduce the book's themes. What it is the author is really trying to teach us as they tell the story. I think um, A Catcher in the Rye does that perfectly. Number four, and this is key, a great beginning will deal with change or the threat of change. Remember the line, where's Papa going with that axe? That is about change. Something is about to happen. With the openings of Skellig and A Monster Calls, I found him in the garage and the monster showed up just after midnight. Change has happened and we know the rest of the book will be about that change. Even in the um, opening of Harry Potter, those perfectly normal Dursleys, the clever reader knows that that normality is about to be shattered. The threat of change pulses in every word there, that thank you very much, you know that they're not going to be so smug in a minute. Um, this is because change is when we are most interested in anything. As Will Store points out in The Science of Storytelling, recommending this book and not for the first time you'll find out, um, all perception is based on change. We only notice things in our vision when they move, really. Um, it's how we detect literally everything. So the more change resonates for the character being impacted, the more interested we are as readers. Number five, most importantly, the opening will introduce your main character without too much backstory. Backstory is necessary, but often for you rather than the reader. I'm going to explain something called the iceberg principle now. Basically backstory is an iceberg. Two thirds of the iceberg is underwater. That's every detail you as a writer need to have in your head or in your notes in order to be able to write the story. The top third of the iceberg, the only bit that people ever see above water, that's what you will put into text. So only introduce enough backstory and conflict to make us care about your characters. You are going for minimum information for maximum reaction. The same goes for setting, actually, and we will talk about that when we look at setting. If you're writing fantasy, you need just enough detail to make it believable. Um, I think that's why I think the opening of Northern Lights is unsurpassed in this respect. Remember those four words? Lyra and her demon. Four words it takes to establish that fantasy world. Most importantly, though, um, the opening will make it clear we should be rooting for your character. That doesn't mean they have to be necessarily likeable, but we need to somehow care about him or her and what happens to them, or we won't turn the page. Um, I don't know if you've ever read The Talented Mr Ripley, but we are completely rooting for a very nasty character indeed. It's very cleverly done. Um, there is a reason for this character set up. I will talk about this briefly now but we will talk about it more in subsequent weeks. Um, character drives any story. First person or third, present or past tense. You may have heard arguments about what is more important, plot or character. You may have heard some people say I write plotty books or my books are character led. For me and for Will Storr and for John York, who I will introduce you to at length um, at other times. This is twaddle. Plot is character. Plot, which is how you get your story from its premise to the concluding idea, only happens how it does because of the lead character. They will only go on the journey they do because of who they are. They will only decide what to do in any dilemma because of who they are. Plot equals character. At the beginning, at the end, and driving everything in between. So I always start with character. This character must be flawed. By that I don't mean bad. I mean something's missing. Their worldview maybe is skewed and as such it's going to get them into trouble. So they need to learn something. They won't necessarily know this, but we as writers and readers probably will. Um, certainly we will as writers. Um, this will play into the themes of the book. It will be the lesson they and the readers learn at the end. So that's need. And alongside this unacknowledged need, they will actively want something. 
This needs to be something important. They need to care enough to keep pursuing it throughout the book so that we as readers care and keep turning the page. This want drives plot. Um, the want will usually be catalyzed by the book's inciting incident. And together these want and need um, make up the premise, the big what if. So for example, in Millions by Frank Cottrell Boyce, the premise is, what if two motherless poor boys found a holdall full of pound notes? Now Frank, being clever, ramps this premise up immediately by adding a ticking clock so that it becomes, what if two motherless poor boys found a holdall full of pound notes, but they only had a few days to spend them before England converts to the euro? What follows is the story of one of the boys in pursuit of their want while Frank throws bad things at them, forcing them into dilemmas where he has to choose a path to get closer to his want, money. In the end, he of course learns that what money can't buy is love. Remember I mentioned the boys were motherless. That was his real need, of course. And that story is the only the story it is because of Damien's character. Frank actually points this out. I shall read you the opening to this. If our Anthony was telling this story, he'd start with the money. It always comes down to money, he says, so you might as well start there. He'd probably put, once upon a time there were 229,370 little pounds sterling, and go on till he got to, and they all lived happily ever after in a high interest bank account. But he's not telling this story, I am. What Frank excels in is getting character across from the off, from the very first page, first paragraph, first line even. And that for me is incredibly important. As writers, you should be working to get in as much character detail as possible from the off so that we care about them as they head off on their journey in pursuit of their want, their holy grail, their amulet, their one true love or the murderer. If you don't make the reader care and care quickly, they won't be bothered reading on. So I want to look at how another couple of writers do that. I'm going to start with another one by Frank Cottrell Boyce. Um, this is the beginning to Cosmic. Uh, the opening for this is up on Minerva as well, so you can read along um, or you may have a copy. This is the opening. I'm going to show you that so you can have a quick look at what it looks like on the page because this is significant. So I am not exactly in the Lake District. Mum. Dad, if you're listening, you know I said I was going to the South Lakeland Outdoor Activity Centre with the school. To be completely honest, I'm not exactly in the Lake District. To be completely honest, I'm more sort of in space. I'm on this rocket, the infinite possibility. I'm about 200,000 miles above the surface of the Earth. I'm all right. Ish. I know I've got some explaining to do. This is me doing it. Brilliant opening. Um, so what can we glean from this? There are facts and there are extrapolations. And we'll go through that line by line. In fact, I'm gonna show you this again so you can see, because this is important. So we have lowercase chapter headings. Can you see that? That is a stylistic choice that sets the tone for the passage to follow. The error is childish, vulnerable even. We are dealing with a character whose youth leads them to make mistakes. Secondly, the first line, Mum, Dad, if you're listening, it's addressed to absent parents. It's a poignant line that if you're listening, that's our caring moment. It tugs on heartstrings. We are sympathetic. We are invested. The line also speaks to one of the themes of the novel, what makes a good dad? And the implicit answer is one who listens. In terms of point of view, the sentence has an internal narrator. We're using first person present tense. That means whatever error of judgment this character has made, they are feeling the effects right now. There isn't the reassurance that we get with past tense that everything worked out okay in the end. In other words, we are tense. That you know I said is familiar. We've all done it. It rings true. It also makes us wonder, what was the lie that was told? Conflict is at the heart of story and a good lie is weighty with conflict. So the opening line introduces a vulnerable character, 
sets out the theme and creates tension and conflict in 22 words. Carrying on, we're not even done yet. The next two sentences use anaphora, a rhetorical device where the same words are repeated at the start of successive sentences. To be completely honest, this emphasises the point, but then it slips into humour because it's caveated with not exactly and more sort of, the kind of half-truths that children try to tell um, to lessen a blow. It also makes him vulnerable again. The next sentences are all tell, which you uh, may have been and probably will be again warned off. But here the direct report of the events grounds the reader in the setting of the novel and the tone is honest, factual, ambiguity is all gone. But then we're taken back to vulnerability again with I'm all right-ish. So we're hooked. We have a clever premise here, all set out for us. The boy's stuck in space and we want to know how he got there. Remember the idea of change? Liam is supposed to be somewhere else. He's stuck and he needs to get home. Otherwise, he's going to die. That's a massive threat of change right there. The main theme of the book is there. The tone of the book is clear, funny, but pulling on heartstrings. And we have a character who is vulnerable, so we instinctively root for them. Now, I doubt Frank thought any of this out in this level of detail. He has been writing for years. It's instinctive. He doesn't need to study um, Will Storr and John York. He knows how a good opening works without thinking about it. Some of you, if you've read a lot and written a lot, will have that instinct. If not, then the best way is to read, but read as a writer. Look for the tricks. Think back to some of those opening lines and paragraphs. The ones that really pack a punch do so, not because they're beautiful, but because they're brimming with detail. Okay. That, and that is it for Brilliant Beginnings. We will talk about a lot of these things in future weeks, though, as well. Bye.